My name's Alyssa Carpio. I am a recently retired IFBB Figure Pro. I competed in the NPC and the IFBB Pro League figure and fitness for 20 years. Um, so it was a really great run. Um, with my last season, I think I just, I felt like I had sort of exhausted all of my personal goals for the sport um, other than winning and going to the Olympia, which you can't really control, right? But everything within myself, I think that I felt like I was trying to get out of it internally from like a growth perspective. And even with the development of my physique, um, I finally like came to terms with all that. And um, it, I felt in a good space to hang up the suit and heels, as they say. Um, so it's been, I think, about five months since my last competition, which was the Daytona Pro in the end of September of last year. And it's been interesting because, um, you know, uh, one thing I noticed is when you're competing and you're just busying yourself, like take any anything like your career or whatever, if you're just busying yourself a lot with stuff like that, um, once that's gone, it like, it's not that the thing was creating, it wasn't feeling necessarily what it was supposed to feel. It was almost like a distraction. But now, like, when you have that gone, you're, like, faced to kind of address the things within yourself that were just, you didn't have time to think about before. So that's why I want to say, like, it really depends on how much of your identity is wrapped in the thing mm. when you get to that point, like, how difficult that is for you. And also, like, how much you're willing to go internal and kind of deal with um, a lot of your own unresolved issues that you might have, you know, pushed down or distracted yourself from for months or years what does it feel like now to to know like okay this chapter of my life was was then and even though you know you may still have like connections with it and you may still you know do that side of, of the be in that side of the world in, in certain ways to what degree to you now do you feel like that it was like a separate time or or maybe a different time versus a new time or does it just just does it just feel like a continuation like you know what i'm trying to say like how did did it feel wrapped up in a bow like okay this is that thing and now we're kind of mm -hmm. you know putting that in like a nice little box like a little memory box right or is it just kind of like okay you know we have these memories we have these things and we're going to just continue to take them with us as we go and or how did how mm -hmm. did you kind of handle it yeah I, I always wondered that about that before i got to that point because you see pro athletes and they all handle their retirement differently. Some of them retire and come back. Some of them retire when they're at the peak of their, you know, performance. And then some hang on through all these injuries. And it's just sad to see. And you're like, please just let it go. I mean, I understand why. Like, I understand why. Um, for me, like, I didn't, I didn't want to be that person that was just, like, stringing it along because I couldn't give it up. Because that's the only thing I felt like I had that was worth anything. Um, so I guess that is probably the best lead in for it. Like I just got to a point in my life where um, I felt like I didn't have anything else to prove necessarily to not only the world, because I know we talk about, you know, do what you want, but to myself, mm -hmm. um, because we all in various degrees pursue things, you know, accomplishments and success for self-validation. So um, it's very empowering in whenever you achieve that in whatever it is you're, you're going towards, whether that's career development or, you know, family and life, which, whatever you want that to look like or a hobby or a sport. So, um, yeah, I just built upon it year after year. When I first started competing, I wasn't intending on, I, I didn't have my sights set on like being pro or being an Olympian or anything like that. I just wanted to do it and kind of test the waters. and. You know, each one that I did, I got a little bit better. I placed a little bit higher and I got judges feedback and they were like, do this, do that. But, you know, I started quickly moving up to national shows. So every time I reached a new level, I'd be like, oh, maybe I can do the next. You know, maybe I can do the next. And it just evolved into where it was over a 20 year period. But um, so when I first decided, like it was this a decision process for me wasn't like I didn't just wake up one day and be like okay I'm done you know I had been thinking about it for like the last probably year and a half 
um, I was starting to get like sort of that long term exhaustion from it because after 20 years of training and really like honing in on the advanced levels to train and do nutrition and to run your cycles and recovery, um, I felt like there wasn't a whole lot more for me to like get ROI on. I feel like I kind of tapped all those areas out. You know, I tried everything out there, if you get what I mean. Yeah. And I've, I've tried multiple coaches, multiple programs, and I always gave them enough time. I didn't just jump around impulsively. Like, I don't do that. But, um, you know, I tried everything until I feel like, okay, this is just kind of like me fighting against I don't know what you want to call it. I don't I don't like to put a label to things as excuses. So I wouldn't say it's me fighting against my age or me fighting against genetics because I've never wanted to consider those as possibilities because they're self-limiting. For whatever reason, <laughs> you know, I got to this point this last season where it's like, hey, you still don't have enough muscle. Build up your upper body, build up your quads. It's like the same story I've been hearing for like 10 or 12 years. And the last couple of years of, of my... um not even my prep, like my whole approach to it year long was like complete, complete dedication to it 365 days a year. And I don't go on Instagram or whatever and brag about that. There's just no point in doing that, you know, but like I would stick to everything and I, and I, because I wanted to, I'm like, I can make the most progress, the fastest. What can I do to have an advantage over other people? You know, I can stick to my shit all year long. I can, every time I train, I can go in and do a hundred percent, you know, I can maximize my recovery, maximize my um, nutrition, my water, my supplement intake. So that's really what I did. And I just had it in this really synergistic balance for the past, the final two or three years of my competing. So I really feel like I maximized everything I could in that window of time. I made a lot of progress with my physique in that window of time because of that. Um, and I really felt like I can't train any harder. Maybe there's a, you know, and I toyed with some different training methodology with different trainers I was working with. Like we, some of my trainers, they were a little more volume, some were a little more intensity, but you know, it's some health better than others, but there wasn't this thing where like, I'm not a gym newbie. I'm not just going to go in and have, and just blow up all of a sudden after 20 years of training, <laughs> you know? So I was starting to get sort of that. I got to come in there with drive like every single day to get the training out how it needs to be, which I think is, is manageable and easy to do when you're um, getting validated. I want to say external validation, right? Like it's good to say, I like my physique. I'm happy with it, but we all are to whatever degree still competing to place higher, win, improve our placings, that kind of thing. Um, nobody wants to get 16th in every show and they're not going to probably, no, probably not going to do that for 10 years. Right. As long as you can see yourself moving up. Oh, now I'm in 10th. Oh, now a couple years later, maybe I'm in the top five. Then that is enough to sort of like offset that and prevent you from getting the burnout. But I think for me, like it was reversing, I was slipping, you know, there's a lot of new talent coming up. The figure standards are continuing to evolve to like really sophisticated developed physiques I mean the girls look amazing so um yeah for me I was like I just felt like tired about the thought of going in and hitting training as hard as I knew I needed to all the time and um I was losing a little bit of that and at that point I was like for the last seven or eight years I would always say well if the fire's still there I'll still do it and I wouldn't say the fire was out I just noticed that little bit of slip maybe like 10 to 20%, depending on, you know, and um, combined with all those other factors that I just mentioned. So I was at a good place with it, I think, because internally, like I realized a lot on my own worth and value outside of the sport. So it wasn't just like, oh, I'm starting to, you know, my performance and my placings are starting to slip, so I better quit. Um, I didn't need to hang on to that for, for validation any longer. Are you a personal trainer, online fitness coach, or gym owner on the verge of burnout? Are you wanting to grow your fitness business but can't add more hours to your hectic schedule? Introducing Trainer Revenue Multiplier, the premier wealth creation system 
for fitness professionals that helps you earn more and work less. Visit www.trainerrevenuemultiplier.com today to schedule your free business accelerator session. If you're serious about taking your business to the next level, schedule your call today. How was it to go from, you know, doing your last show to doing not bodybuilding, if that makes sense, yeah. right? Because it's a lifestyle. And when you go mm-hmm. from, especially like the, like a show in and of itself is like the, the extreme side of the sport. And you're, you're, you know, you go from prepping to show to, you know, all that kind of even, even post-show, like that kind of side of it too. So the process for me was... I was actually, so if I was in prep, say I was like four to six weeks out in that prep, this happened the last two or three shows that I was prepping for. Um, I would sort of contemplate my retirement and what my training or life might look like after that. You know, I'd like write out all these splits. I'm like, Ooh, so it almost like thinking about that, like gave me like a kind of a sense of relief, to be honest with you and excitement. I was like, wow, I could like come up with a new training split and like train my body the way I want it to look instead of how it needs to look for the standards of this division, which I wanted to downsize my upper body. I wanted to keep my leg size. You know, I wanted like just to make some adjustments overall to the um, the volume and the intensity and, you know, focus on some other areas like yoga, maybe do a little more cardio. So that part excited me. And the other thing that really excited me was being able to take my time and energy that I was putting into bodybuilding all year and actually do other things in my life, <laughs> you know? So I, I just turned 44, but I was like, I have like a lot of other things I'm interested in, in my life, um, career wise, hobby wise, but also, um, relationships, you know, it's like, you can't, if you're currently in one or you're fine being single, that's fine. But if you're like dating, like you, it's, it's hard enough to find somebody in this world, let alone somebody that might be willing. Oh, do you want to go out tonight? Well, no, or I'm bringing chicken and broccoli with me. (laughs) So I did, I'm not saying that I retired so I could start dating. I'm just saying it made it easier for me to open up to that possibility of, oh, maybe I can, you know, be willing and open, but it was important for me to like find myself and like my path first Mm. with that, because I feel like that's how any healthy relationship is. You know, you're not looking for someone else to fill a hole in you or complete you. You kind of like have your own pursuits and I I value my autonomy and my independence a lot. So I wanted to like have that kind of figured out before that got clouded by, you know, me thinking of another person. What does a bodybuilder, especially one who, uh, you know, achieves pretty high, achievements if you will in the sport of bodybuilding and you mentioned too the kind of the external validation of you know whether that be a placement or even just people saying oh man you look great or you know all the things that can be said you know your physique or your training really hard and that's very inspiring all these different things you know where do you go then to fulfill those needs as well like from a from a human perspective from on a training you know because a bodybuilder you know most people's like oh that's kind of the pinnacle of working out mm-hmm. and training and exercise and, and the physique so where do you go in as a human and as an individual person to say this is where and how I'm going to get this a similar at least feeling from going to the gym and from being healthy still and all the things that you know are important and and that are still that you still want to do to some degree yeah and that's an interesting thing you bring up because I would say I I would it wasn't very it wasn't super difficult for me but I would say that that concept about sort of like when you go into the gym your gym atmosphere the expectations of the people around you how they're observing you like that part is probably more difficult than not walking on stage anymore because that's your every day, right? Mm-hmm. Like most most competitors, maybe there's like a handful of you in your gym, right? So you're you're among the elite several few in your gym and that feels good. It feels good walking in and everyone's like, "Dang." You know, and they might not be, but they know. They know when you're prepping. All right, you can you you can join a gym, people will come up to you wow, I really see what you're doing. You're super inspiring. It's obvious you're training for a show, all of that. So I'm not like, I don't feel, I don't need that, but we all enjoy that, right? 
So it would it would sometimes make me uncomfortable, but never to the point where like I didn't want that validation. So I would say the hardest part since then, since I did downsize my physique a lot, um, and I'm not prepping. I don't look like I'm prepping. You know, I I like my physique the way it is. You can still tell that I've trained for 20 years. I don't think that's ever gonna go away. Um, but yeah, like people probably won't come up to me and say stuff like that to me anymore. And I, you know, so that it was a little hard at first. Cause I, I think a lot of competitors, when they go from there, that's where they want to be in prep all the time. Cause as soon as they start prepping, people notice, mm -hmm. yeah, you like the way you look, but you want to show it off and you want people to notice and say stuff to you too. So, um, I don't know where, where was I when I decided so, like I said, I think I just was at the place where I didn't need that. Um, I didn't need that anymore to, to validate my worth. Like, I know that my worth is internal. Um, and I think that how I got to that point was, you know, I do a lot of um, meditation, contemplation. I do a lot of processing and feeling my feelings. So when you do that, what that ends up, giving you back is um compassion and acceptance for yourself so all the things that maybe you think are your dark side or, or negative about you negative traits you know that you don't or negative emotions that you don't want to feel you get to a place through all of that work where you accept all of yourself all of it yeah. um and then when you do that you can offer that to other people but i think the more important thing is like I'm okay with myself. So I don't need to keep trying to prove through all of these external things that I'm okay. And it's, but I want to caveat this by saying it's not a point I don't think you just arrive to. Like I'm not superhuman all of a sudden where I'm not affected by that stuff at all. Yeah. Right. Like I have a job, I get validation out of that. Like I still care about my appearance, I get validation about that. So it's a, it's an ongoing process and it's definitely not linear, but I think the reason I was able to accept it is because I had done enough of that work by the time I decided to move on. And so you mentioned compassion there for yourself. Are you a personal trainer who wants to scale and grow your business online? Have you been coaching online for years yet don't know how to incorporate online into your current business model? Introducing Trainer Revenue Multiplier, the premier wealth creation system for fitness professionals that helps you earn more and work less. Visit www.trainerrevenuemultiplier.com today to schedule your free business accelerator session. If you're serious about taking your business to the next level, schedule your call today. I think um, it's hard to balance compassion with yourself with drive, right? And like, oh, I got to do better. I got to be better. So coming off of like being a bodybuilder to where better and improvement and, and drive is kind of like that's what pushes most people to be better is, is I don't want to say like in, a, in some people it is a negative thing, but it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily have to be negative to where you're like, I'm not good enough, but it can be negative. But when you're done with that and needing that and utilizing that kind of harshness on yourself, how do you go from that to the, the, um, this, the compassion for yourself, but not then like going overboard with that to the degree where, you know, it's like, okay, well, I've been, uh, I did great things in the past and so I can just kind of sit on the couch and eat potato yeah. chips. That's a really great question. Um, I think that, so when you do this work on yourself inside, like say you're, you're a very driven person and you're like, this is my career. I'm going to do this forever. Right. Say you approach, I'm doing this forever bodybuilding. Sometimes doing that in like if I said to a person like that, if you do this in her work, you're going to have all the self-acceptance, you know, you're going to be more at peace with just existing. You're going to be more present in the moment around your family and friends or whoever that people say they want that sometimes, but that actually scares a lot of people, too, because of what you just said. They, they're afraid that they'll lose their drive if they get which actually that can't that can happen. But if you actually do the work and you start having more compassion for yourself, you don't care because then you have compassion for yourself. So I'm OK that I'm like, I, I mean, I used to be super driven and ambitious about everything. And I don't want to say that that's gone. I feel like I'm still the type of person that has to channel that somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's more directed like in my career now and some side projects. 
um, because I don't think I could just completely renunciate everything and become a monk living in the Himalayas, <laughs> right? But yeah. um, but I there was a point when that 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 idea was a threat to me. Um, the idea of it's not even about laziness. Um, like I said, most people they're they're aware of the concept of presence. And they, they say they want that, right? But they struggle with it because if they're sitting somewhere, their mind is racing about the future or whatever it is. Like, I should be I should be more productive right now. I'm wasting my time. I'm just sitting here on the couch watching a movie with my spouse. Like, that's why isn't that valuable? Like, why can't you just rest in that and be okay with it? So, I mean, that's honestly the work that I do with the meditating and stuff. It's about being more present. It's about not trying to flee the moment to get out of a situation, to get into another circumstance or to chase away or pursue another emotion than the one that's in your current state. So when you're talking about presence, it's just accepting whatever state you're in right now, knowing it's, knowing it's temporary, right? Accepting the emotions, knowing they're like a passing state. Um, so that might've been honestly a little bit of a contributing factor to why I lost some of my drive. I think it would have stayed if, like I said, if I had been getting the improvements in my placings, I think the drive would have stayed. But I think because I wasn't then combined with like just more self-acceptance, it kind of got me to the point where I was like, yeah, I don't think I need to try so hard anymore to to prove, like I can just be, I can just be, and that's good enough. Like I still have value and worth just because I'm me, not because I'm chasing something accomplishment of or success all the time so i think the compassion part like when you're when you have accepted yourself you can kind of be compassionate with yourself right uh or if you know when you learn that maybe you know being compassionate with yourself will lead to being you know having self-acceptance then maybe you can get there along that path but is it a struggle at all or was it a struggle at all to like along the way of, of finding that self-acceptance to like look in the mirror and be like whether it's physical or mental or whatever or maybe just because the fact that um just the way that you're feeling that like the self-compassion maybe led to like negative feelings it, it, it all towards yourself i don't know like not necessarily because of the compassion but because of where you are maybe more yeah. trying to accept who you are that then you think about who you are and then sometimes it's like oh am it i good line up. or yeah, like the person you cognitive want to be. Maybe cognitive dissonance, I think, is the term for that. Maybe. Yeah, like yeah. you don't like who you want to be and who you think you are and don't who line you up. To be. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. but so when that that I'm pretty sure that's cognitive dissonance. So that gap, it can be a positive thing because if we're here and we want to be here and we know it's not lined up, that can give us the impetus to go. Right. But if it's too extreme or debilitating or we're just not we're stuck. We're not in a, in a space where we feel like we can act and go there. Maybe it seems too far beyond reach. Then that can be crippling and negative. Um, I would say like one of the things I did struggle with uh, was kind of like, and I'm still honestly trying to figure this out is like find a happy medium with where I want my body. I would say what my body looks like doesn't matter as much to me now. Cause I, I don't have that extreme from the leanness to the, you know, when you go from super lean into your off season, you'll gain five or 10 pounds and feel fat. So I don't have that, but you know, I was like shopping for clothes last night and trying on jeans and seeing my belly as I was like bending over, putting jeans on. And I was like, Ugh. so I don't think you're ever going to be like, oh, I'm perfect. No matter. I mean, maybe I don't want to speak out of turn. Some people may perfectly accept themselves the way they physically are, but I would say that's, something that I'm still kind of like trying to find that balance with. Yeah. Um, like I'm, I'm not hard on myself in terms of if I want to eat chocolate, have some wine, I'll do it. And I don't feel guilty about doing that, which there were times in my life when I would. Um, and that's when I say, Oh, I can just accept that I want this right now. And that's fine. Um, or I'm not going to the gym this morning for cardio because I'm tired. So there's that. But then I think how that actually plays out into what my physique looks like and, you know, am I happy with that? So it's kind of like, it's more of like a body, you know, a lifestyle. Like when you think of online coaches and they work with bodybuilding clients and they work with lifestyle clients, it's really shifting more into like that lifestyle focus where, I don't know, you might have a goal 
you you know if you I've worked with lifestyle clients before sometimes they have a goal to like get cut for summer or do a little bit of a bulk something like that but for me like I want to just kind of like maintain a comfortable space most of the time so I think when I if I notice it my weight's creeping up a little too much and it's not really about my weight it's really about oh I hadn't been to the gym you know I missed two or three workouts this week because I let work or other things get in the way so all of those normal things that regular people have to deal with. But when you're a competitor, you don't even let be a factor because yeah. your goal is so important. Like, I mean, I used to leave work in the middle of the day to go to the gym because I work from home. I'm like, I don't care. I'm blocking out three to 5 PM because that's the time of day when I can train the best and nobody's in the gym to steal the equipment that I need. <laughs> you know? So right now I'm like, I'll go. We were talking about this last time. I'll go at like five thirty, six 6 AM now and lift because I don't have to be at like, okay, what time of day is my peak performance level? I'm okay if I'm at like 85% at 6 a.m. You know, that's not terrible. I'll take that over not going at all. Right. <laughs> and I think the cognitive dissonance um, maybe is a big factor, you know, getting into like a new aspect or new territory of your life because for so long, whether it's bodybuilding or, you know, you were a business owner and you had these strict kind of things you had to do, you know, you get into, and maybe a lot of people experience this too, with just general retirement, you know, you have this, these habits mm -hmm. and you have these, these things that you have to do. And all of a sudden you're, you have nothing to do. So then you go back to like, how would I feel most recently if I didn't do any of these things and it's bad, right? You would feel like guilty. You would feel, yeah. you know, and then going from the extremes of doing all this stuff to then, like, okay, well, I can skip this workout if I really, you know, if I want to, I can skip it. And it's not like it's going to be a big deal. Like mm -hmm. in, the, in the physical world, it's not going to matter. But in your brain. That kind of like leads me into sort of like the process because we don't really talk about that. Like I did have like a plan and a process, even if it was loose. Um, like I still am planning photo shoots. So to a degree, that's going to keep me regimented and on a diet, right? Um, and I still like, I immediately restructured my training and, and gave myself a meal plan. So it's, it's more livable, but I wasn't just like going from this super strict regimented thing to nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important like to point out, like, even if you're going to, you know, kind of like pull back the intensity or, or change the focus or whatever, like, I think you still have to have a plan, like. Yeah. So you don't just feel like you're uselessly floundering around um, and set, maybe setting some kind of what, like whatever the goals are. So like I said, I had, I had physique goals. Like I want my upper to body to look like this. I want my lower to look like this. So I wrote my training program about that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and also like, like you mentioned with the retirement thing, um, probably having something that you can transition into, like maybe when you're still competing, I mean, this is how I was for the last few years. I'd be like, man, if I wasn't competing all the time, I would do this or do that. Like you have sort of like hobbies or side projects that you wish you had time to do. Um, so kind of getting those going or get setting like a plan in motion for something like that. Because mm -hmm. um, I have, I actually have recently worked with a, a woman who retired last summer um, because I'm in my advanced yoga teacher training, which is about one-on-one -on -one therapeutic programs for people. And this is a case study that we're doing right now. So, you know, she was really like a senior level manager director in this company for like 20 years, super ambitious project manager telling people all the time, go do, you know, and they just would. And then nothing after that. And um, she can't, it's, it's hard for her to like find a hobby to pursue because she's not really passionate about, it. I mean, she has side hobbies, but if it's not something that you're really passionate about, you're probably not going to put that much time and energy into it. Mm -hmm. But also for her, like she has to mourn the grief and loss of that phase of her life. Um, and then, like I said, all of these other things that maybe happened during that time, like she lost her husband. She didn't fully process that. Now she's facing all this because she has nothing to sort of like run away mm -hmm. to, you know what I mean? So that brings up a good point but I think for most of us in order to avoid like the slam of the overwhelm of all of those things coming together at once which is it's just too heavy 
like even if you're going to work on meditating and processing trauma and past losses like you can't just go from one extreme and thrust yourself instantly i don't think anybody can really do that yeah but so i think like having the plan in place having something structured but also like be being if you can like i say be easy on yourself well that you can't necessarily tell a person like that like you said you know you feel guilty if you miss a workout well i don't maybe if i missed you know three or four in a row i do but i don't feel bad if i just miss one um people are different with that so i can't necessarily say oh just accept however it is like that's a process that everybody has to work through individually right I think we have a, you know, in, in, in this society, it's, it's more about like achievement and go, 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 and always something to do. And I never really thought about it like that until you said it, but you, but when you do go from like one path to the next thing, or, uh, you know, whether that's a choice by force of, you know, situation, whatever, this podcast is sponsored by smoking gun coffee, a veteran owned coffee company that strives to give back to those in need. Don't forget to use code TWR10 for a 10% discount at checkout. I think there's a couple things that I'm thinking about with that. For Like when the extreme, when you're on and you're fully into it, like I think about that like if I'm in the height of prep or any training and nutrition cycle when you're just like really in good shape, everything's firing on all cylinders, you're super motivated, you don't miss anything. When you think about what's going on, like mentally and psychologically, like you're releasing all these endorphins all the time, you know, not only the endorphins, but like you have the achievement, the success, the validation. So it's really easy for that wheel to keep spinning when you're in that zone. And I think that's also one of the reasons why, like you are not the only one to do this. I talk to people that do this all the time. You think back to that time longingly and you're like, oh, I remember when everything was just like I was on it all the time like I was unstoppable and you want that back right so I think that's why the middle is like yeah it's the middle it's like lukewarm water it's like the middle is okay so I mean you can get that from like other things in life it doesn't have to just be the gym but I think for people that are gym people like whatever you've tasted is your personal peak of success like you're always going to want to get back to that and then it's just not that hard it's just not that easy to stay there because all of these other life things get in the way you know so yeah, and, and that's funny you mentioned the other life things because that's exactly what I was like thinking about too like my secondary thought was like first I was like okay I, w- I want to get back into it I want to get back to where I was I want to do these things and start improving again and then my next thought was I remember I had to like be a lot more regimented had to you know take Sundays and meal prep. And I had to spend a, spend more time at the gym, which isn't a big deal, but like that's time that you're not doing something else. Um, maybe more money into certain things, whether it's food or supplements, or if you do go down the coaching route again, like you do, you know, spend money on those things, you know, so you start to think, or I started to think about maybe for the first time ever, like not just like how it felt to be there and like, that was good. And I want to get back, but also like, what am I then replacing or giving up or sacrificing if you whatever you know whatever you want to call it to get back to where I was and then like am I going to be happier there or was it just I was happy then and so looking back I remember myself happy but I'm not actually going to be as happy as I was if I do all the stuff again to get where I was yeah and I I probably should have said life things get in the way like I feel like that's a negative way of saying it because It implies that, you know, oh, if I didn't, if I had all my other life crap together, or if I was more disciplined disciplined or more motivated, then I could just do this. And I don't want to set that tone because I don't believe that that's true. Like, I think, like you said, um, there's nothing wrong with other things in your life being a priority. We're not talking about like being, being completely sedentary and healthy here, right? We're talking about the, the gym rat mindset of, Being, you know, healthy and going to the gym and mostly good with my nutrition, like, isn't enough sometimes. Like, I feel like I should be doing more. Like, but like you said, you, it's a personal thing where you have to introspect, you have to weigh all of those. And I think it's also important to say, like, there's different times in your life when you're going to want to focus more on that versus other things. Mm -hmm. 
Um, or you, you, you know, like it's easy, like you said, I'm meal prepping all this stuff all week, but you know, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I don't want to spend five hours a week of my life cooking <laughs> and I can still eat pretty healthy if I, you know, buy some pre-made things and maybe like whatever, get some meal fresh delivered or something like that. So um, I think it's when we're doing this, like it's important to consider all those things and, and go deeper into it instead of just stay at the surface level of, you know, why can't I be disciplined? Why can't I be motivated? Which is the deepest most people go with it and they, they don't understand why. Like there's so many other factors that have nothing to do with discipline and motivation. Those standards may not be, you know, what they were previously, but they can still be certain standards that I feel good about. And yeah, I think that's why uh, I'll just go in and I'll pick like one crazy exercise on leg day to go nuts with and still train it. Like if it's squats or deadlifts, still train it the same way. You know, I wasn't really thinking that of, on, like, on like a psychological level until you said that, but that's that's probably why I do that. I'm like, yeah, just to give myself, yeah, I still, I still can do this if I want to. <laughs> just, yeah, just as like a little reminder that this, it's still within me. I think yeah. that. I think that maybe that's once again, going back to like the athlete thing, why people have trouble retiring in general is like they have that one great game you know, through for 300 yards and three touchdowns, no interceptions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the next game, next six games, you might, you know, suck, but at least like, oh, I know that's still in there somewhere. So if I can just get that feeling one more time. And we're not even talking about imposter syndrome. That's a whole nother episode. But if you do have that one game, then you don't recreate it. You're like, was that a fluke? Do I really have these skills? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I would say that health has been something that I focused on more because I, in a way I was probably say like I took it for granted when I was competing because I didn't really have to intentionally focus on it as much. It was a byproduct of everything I was doing, mental health and, and physical health, you know, and emotional health. But um, now if I don't go to the gym as much or if my eating is off, then I really, I do notice like, wow, I feel bad today. Like, why do I feel bad? Whether that's, I have a headache or, you know, my stomach hurts or I feel sluggish or, you know, I have like no mental energy or a moody um, are all, almost always, I don't want to say, you know, attributed to that, but you can just go to the gym and walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes and half that stuff will go away. <laughs> It's funny you mentioned that. I mean, I was feeling like that today and I realized at the end of the day, you know, the work day, I hadn't gotten, gone outside the whole day. I, I stood up, you know, probably like 15 mm -hmm. minutes of the whole day. Yeah. And the first thing I did when I got back home was I went, went outside and took a walk and I was actually on my way to go to the apartment gym and walk on the treadmill. And I was like, you know, I think going outside, <laughs> have, you know, even though it's a little chilly, but, you know, going outside and being in the sun and like the sunlight and that whole aspect. And it's just like I did, I felt like a little renewed and refreshed and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's funny how, like, just when you know those things though, like it, it makes, at least it makes me feel like, even though I do feel like a little bad, it, it makes me not feel as whatever that symptom is as you know yeah whatever. exactly because i know that i can have a little control over it if i do these things so it kind of makes me feel like i have some of that power yeah it does it does um and just the act of doing it like you know you you chose in that moment to do something that's good for yourself so it might not be like you said the end result might not be oh i'm 100 percent fixed now but you do feel a little bit better but you feel empowered because you made that choice instead of sitting on the couch or drinking a beer or whatever, you know, the alternative was, which doesn't always, like I said, it doesn't always make you feel bad, like guilty, but you don't get the benefit of the positive feeling of actually doing the thing. For sure. Yeah. So, you know, yourself, what do you, what do you look forward to? I think not the most per se, because I think there's a lot like to think about when it comes to that, but what do you look forward to in regards to, like milestones, I guess, when it comes to still um, not just like, okay, I'm going to work out or train now because I have this photo shooter because I have X, Y, Z, you know, summer coming up or whatever. But like, do you still have like those milestones that you're looking forward to hitting or that maybe it's performance based, maybe it's whatever based that you're, that you've kind of set out or that you at least have thought about setting out in the future? 
Yeah, I have. I think I've been at it long enough to kind of know where I've settled in right now. Like I said, it's about been but about five months. So what I really like to do is I like to go in the morning and either do cardio or lift and do cardio. And then I like to go back at night and do another round of cardio. Um, so my cardio is not super crazy. Um, I just walk on the treadmill at like a three and a half incline for a half an hour, keeping my heart rate like above 120. Um, but it's also like a time where you can just tune out to music or whatever, you know, it feels good. It's kind of like this, no matter how tired I am, I can pretty much always do that. I have to be pretty wiped out to not be able to just walk, you know, especially if once you get in the car and drive there, you got a, got a little bit of energy and then your music kind of kicks in. Um, but like, as far as like my overall program and stuff goes, like, I want to just be able to come in, you know, hit my upper body twice a week. I have like an upper body A mix, an upper body B mix, a quad day and hams and glutes. If I can, if I can do those each once a week, I'm fine. I typically do like a rotational split. I, I do, you know, but like I miss days, so I might not get everything in on. I don't, I don't know. Like I do a rotational split. So I'll just set my week out and then it'll be like Saturday is upper mix A, you know, Sunday is quads. And then I'll just make sure that my two leg days are far enough apart that they're not really interfering with each other. So on some days I might get more lifts in than others, but I think just like for me, what would feel good is to just be able to consistently follow that plan, you know, without, without missing too many lifts. I don't usually miss the cardio, but sometimes I miss the lifts because it's harder to gear up for that when your energy is low. Right. And sometimes in the morning, I'm like, wow, I just can't go in and lift. And then if I wait till the end of the workday, I'm like, I'm wiped out. Like I, I, like I said, I could, I would force myself to do it when I was competing, or I would just take a break in the middle of the day to do it. But now I'm like, well, I'll lift tomorrow. Like I have three more days in the week that I can get it in. And then that doesn't always happen. So I want to just find like a happy place with all of that, right? Where I'm consistently doing it. If I miss, if I only lift three times in a one week, that's fine. I'm fine with that. You know, maybe I'll do four or five the next. Um, but like, and just like, pretty happy with maintaining whatever my current like physique is. Like I said, like you said, not worrying about getting lean for a shoot, just like maintaining the weight on a more consistent basis. Um, and I kind of know where I want to fall with that. I, honestly, I haven't weighed myself on the scale. I don't think since I competed last, I have, but I doubt my weight has changed that much. I probably dropped muscle and add a little bit of fat. I'm probably still right around you know, 155, I would guess once maybe 155, 160 if I needed to. So, I mean, that doesn't really matter to me because I'm not on strict bulking or cutting goals. Right. Um, but I know how my clothes fit, like, you know, the normal things that people say, oh, my, they're kind of tight around the waist. So I'd, I'd like to like get my waist a little tighter, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I'm not largely unhappy with where I am, even having the extreme standards that I had before. I think it was actually harder as a competitor to accept your body. And I don't even want to say in the off season because when I got really lean or when you're, you're recomping during the first few months of prep. So you're putting on a lot of muscle too. So you don't just look, what felt good to me as a, as a female competitor was like, I want that little tight, tight body, right? Tiny. Like I never wanted to feel like massive. Like I wanted the size and development to be there. But when you think of somebody like, Sid Gillen, you know, Miss Figure Olympia, like you see her in person and she's tiny. It's just the structure and the development makes her look that. So um, I always felt more comfortable when during those first few months of leaning down. I didn't want to be 170 pounds, which was my peak off season weight. Um, but then when I would get really lean, I would say during the last four to six weeks of prep, I would get super self-conscious during that phase um, because you you feel like you start, at least for me, I felt like I started to lose a little bit of my femininity. Your hair starts to dry out, you know, your cheekbones sink in and you know, all this stuff, like your skin sometimes is dry. Like you're just not getting much fat. You're kind of like, <laughs> and then your certain body parts aren't quite as full as they would be, you know, so like your skin droops a little bit and stuff like that. So those extremes, they're really hard to like, 
accept your body like right now it might not be like perfectly where I want it but because it's not changing so drastically like I think I'm more accepting of where I am Hmm. that's that's interesting to think that you know especially over uh, a career that those things you know that those things just cycle like that that it's like okay I feel this way about it in this time and then I know that in this you know specific period that it's going to be you know my mindset's going to be more this along those lines and um is that something that you think this is just based on like it's more surrounds the each individual person like some people are just more comfortable being that way and that's how they'll be and some some people Mm -hmm. like in their career like you said that they're not going to be as comfortable in the last couple weeks because that's how you just feel about it like do you feel like that that's more just like a stagnant thing for most people i think that if there's one universal especially for female competitors it's that we want to be lean all year (laughs) you know in terms of how much size you're one tend to carry I think that's very individual because you know female bodybuilders they're not going to have a problem I mean they're trying to achieve that look even a lot of the physique girls but I think if you look at like a bikini girl or bikini girls they pretty much stay I mean in my opinion they're in their off season you look like you're four weeks out of a show to me in your off season (laughs) you know what I mean like they're the ones that kind of stay I think the most consistent year round and then like with figure wellness and some of the physique girls, like we, we have more extremes and that's individual depending on like your coach says you need to pack on weight, you're going to pack on weight. Right. So, um, but I, yeah, I think we all handle that differently. Um, I, I, a lot of the women that I know in the sport they're they like their off season. They, they take a lot of pictures of their body in their off season and post it you know, on their social media and they, they look great. They're confident. Um, so I guess there's a difference here too. I'm getting at between like just adding some extra body fat with some muscle versus if you really bulk up and you add a lot of muscle in one, a lot of muscle in one, um, off season cycle, like that can be difficult. We don't really talk about that. We talk about like, Oh, you don't, you're not as lean. So that's hard, but we don't really talk about like you just put on I don't know, five pounds of muscle in the last how many ever months like that. Like I didn't, my upper body, like I was like, I feel like a, like a linebacker and I can't wear a gown. Like that's a whole new level of yourself. You have to get used to because like I said, it's new. So Mm. I think that's a hard part with figure getting more developed. Now that was a hard part for me to, to get acceptance with, because I put a lot of muscle in my upper body the last year prepping for that final season and um you know you, you can't wear any clothes you can't go shopping like a normal person <laughs> kind of hard but it's hard to, it's hard to feel it was hard for me to feel feminine at like a what what was my extreme end of that yeah it is interesting kind of I mean that's a whole whole other topic but kind of how we how we do perceive those things but um it was great getting to chat again. I mean, we could definitely just once again continue to, to kind of go on and on about these things. I think it's really fascinating, kind of the mental side. Yeah, I appreciate it too. We always have great talks, so I'm sure there will be another one. <laughs> I'm mostly on Instagram. My Instagram is at Alyssa underscore Carpio. If you're tired of searching for a coach or trainer, somebody who knows what they're talking about and has experience, make sure you go check out the new Coach's Corner on weightroompodcast.com. You can find quality, qualified coaches to help you achieve your goals, whether that's in bodybuilding or just general fitness. Stop wasting time and start achieving your goals today. The link to the Coach's Corner is down in the description below.